So since you guys are all here, um, are there any cool, like burning questions that you guys have? All right, I see hand up this guy. I have a no. question, hi. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, plots and figures. So I have some, you know, pretty naturally colorful, put in my teeth right there, <laughs> um, naturally colorful plots that were made with Seaborn. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just wondering like, what are best practices so should I kind of have all the plots be the same color or not too many colors or, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a really good point. Um, I think this is when um, we had our talk about visualization and I could really talk for days about like the theory of visualizations and stuff like this. Um, I always forget this, like back in like college, like I did like an advanced visualization class for like grad school. Um, and we talked about like all this theories about like, you know, why you should do certain visualizations and stuff. And one big thing people talk about it, or one thing, like when I talk about visualizations, we're like, well, what's the big deal? Like, it's just a visualization. And the big deal about it is that whatever you put down visually, like if you can kind of imagine you flash like a picture in front of someone's face, right? Or a bunch of different pictures in front of their face over like an hour long presentation, and then they leave right? They're not going to remember every single detail, but there's certain things that will stand out a lot in their heads, right? About like what visually happened. So you want to make sure what you visually show them is going to emphasize what is, you know, quote unquote, true, if this makes sense. Like, and when I say true, I mean like the thing that you want to emphasize to your stakeholders, right? Because all the data you show should be true in that sense, but it's the thing that you're really having them focus on. Um, so one thing with colors, um, obviously, like don't use colorblind, like you be aware of people who are colorblind. There's actually a pretty large proportion of the population that is colorblind. It's a little more common in men than it is women, um, but something to consider. So don't put red on green. Um, that's like the most common colorblindness. Um, the second thing is, is like, if you can avoid color, color should come second, right? So one thing, I, I really hate that this is the default, but like if you do matplotlib plot, live, see born, when you make a bar plot, like, um, it does like default colors every single bar is a different color they don't have to be different colors right like they should it doesn't matter because you can see they're different bars so there's not a reason to have that distinction between the two um this is also the reason why pie charts make me kind of annoyed because it's like they give extra color um so that's like okay cool like those are the basics right and then you're like okay like does it matter what color should they all be different colors or you know like let's say you have all the like your bar chart is blue on this one green on this one yellow on this one does that matter? And this is where I'll say, it depends really what you want to focus on. This is more aesthetics, but I have seen is that if you have a more, like more, how do I say this? Um, I'm sure there's a better term for this in presentation stuff, but like a consistent like color palette throughout your presentation, that does keep the audience engaged. So one is that's like, okay, like you're not like, moving to, it sounds weird to say this because it's like oh changing different colors and stuff like that. people get confused like are these colors supposed to mean something or are they actually like emphasizing something else beyond what you're showing and if there really isn't you really should just keep it the same color but also it gives a nice polish like i think when you show that you have a good presentation that you worked hard on it shows a lot and i think people get a little more engaged versus like something that someone seems like they see the same fonts over and over and over again with the white black ground in the black you know text essentially on the back like it gets very like monotonous it kind of blends in stuff like this i'm guilty for doing this by the way um like i'll do white background and like little um black bullet points but um i have seen this done really really well where someone will definitely have like thought about like what is their theme for their presentation i think powerpoint and other presentation things will kind of have this but they'll make sure their um their visualization matches with their um like their palette, they're basically like theme of their overall presentation. And if you're really good at this, and this is where like, I need to find this good example, because right? there definitely was a student that was like, you definitely have this like knack, like, like maybe a little natural talent, maybe practice and stuff like this. But um, they made their visualization. So they had like from, let's say, um, one category to another category. So let's talk about like, you know, they said teenagers, I don't know, middle, middle age and elderly, right? Like those were the three different categories. And they had like some comparison plot. I don't remember exactly what it was but each comparison plot had the same color palette. And so you immediately looked at that visualization and you knew, oh, this is what we just saw from a previous one. We're comparing these two. So versus like having the teenagers in orange and then a different plot or like a plot for the elderly 
um, that was like in blue, but it was the same kind of comparison. They made those the same color uh, palette. So that way they made sure like you can emphasize, you can like compare them like in your head a little bit. Does that make sense? I know it's really tough for me not like talking about visualizations. I'm just talking out loud versus like showing you guys. Um, but that would be my advice, like, you know, kind of like saying, do the basic stuff, which is like, if you can, don't use color unless it has a real emphasis for something. Keep a consistent, you know, palette, consistent theme, um, and then use color to your advantage. To basically, have a nice, like, good visual language of like saying, oh, well, if I'm doing, you know, this bar plot that's going to compare, let's say, like, eating habits of teenagers, and then you have a bar plot for eating habits for the elderly, you would want those to have some kind of visual sameness to it. So you can kind of compare the two. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's helpful. Thank you. No problem. Uh, yeah. Cool. And I just kind of pulled this up immediately. Like, I was like, oh, let me pull this up. Um, I think I have the, uh, I have uh, too much information probably <laughs> like on this, these notebooks too. So um, you can kind of find this out, right? On the repo from our study group from before. Um, yeah, any other questions that are burning in your guys' heads? Like, you're like, I need to ask this question. Or not, you're just like a little whisper in your head. No? Nothing with mine right now? Okay. Um, so I guess I can give you guys some overall advice, if that would be helpful then. Um, so one is that if um, we're, a week, you know, we have one week left, right? Well, less than one week now. Um, we have two, today's Tuesday, and then we'll start doing assessments next week. Um, one recommendation I will have for you guys is even if you plan your thing for Friday next week, or even let's say at the extreme end, not next week, but the week after next week on Friday, so you have like another two weeks, um, try as best you can not to plan on um, doing like preparing your project during the um that next week because you'll be learning mod two stuff in trying to do your project and that's just a recipe for just a lot more stress than you need like if you have to don't worry like you know people do this all like you know people get through it perfectly fine but if you can avoid it you know definitely try to avoid that um just because i think that's something that i see a lot of where people get extra stress because they're new module and they're trying to do their project at the same time um a couple things uh we're about a week into it so at this point um, you should be done with data. You should not be getting more data. Uh, don't try to use it web scraping. Don't pull APIs and stuff like this. Um, you're going to give probably yourself more of a headache than actually doing the analysis. Remember, like that's the main thing that you want as a data, as a data scientist, you are pulling data and trying to figure out, give insights to your stakeholders. And if you spend all of your time just gathering the data, like that's great, but that's not what the stakeholders want. They don't want more data. They want to know about what you're doing with your data, okay? Um, so hopefully everyone has gotten data that they wanted. Um, you know, if you're on the extreme end, you're like, you know, you know what, like, I had things that come up, you know, this past week and whatnot, I haven't been able to do all these things. Um, you can definitely use like the zip data. If you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're like, you know what, I did a whole bunch of web scraping or APIs or whatever you end up doing and there's the zip data and you haven't touched it, don't worry about it. Like you have the data you have, okay? Um, that'd be a big thing I would say at this point is like, um, and if let's say you're like, oh my gosh, like, let's, let's just pretend like, like, oh, I haven't started the project at all. Like, I would say, okay, give yourself two days, at maybe three days at most to really go through the data that's already there. Don't go pull up new data. Uh, you don't need to use an API or web scraping for this project. Um, and, you know, sometimes this happens just in real life where you have a project and, you know, something comes up where you have to put things on hold and stuff like that. So that's my advice. Um, it's very flexible and all that stuff. Um, so I'm trying to think a little bit of like the order of stuff you have. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah, feel free yeah, to actually. interrupt me too, guys. Um, okay, I was, gonna, yeah. I was gonna say I could wait. To, thank you. Um, so when, let's say I have a series of subplots, um, you know, three or four of them, and I just copy and paste that, should I be doing like a for loop instead or some other method or is it okay? I feel like I know what I wanna analyze in my mind and I see the data and I just like do it kind of as fast as possible. <laughs> but like, I know that it's probably good to learn, you know, more eloquent or like faster ways of doing things. So that was my question. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you're saying like you have a, like a visualization or some kind of like cell, right. And you're kind of like, kind of doing using that same code, but like changing one aspect of it and then like exactly. rewriting it. Like yeah. if I have like, and you know, if I define the axes and so then I'm going to have four subplots, that's really, you know, it's basically, yeah, just getting repeated for like zero, one, two, three. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is where, um, it's tough to do this for data science because a lot of times, like you said, like, oh, I'm just like going right into it. Like, I know what I want. I see the code here. I'm just going to copy and paste and go for it. And I think that's a legitimate thing to do. Um, I will say kind of like, a, like um, a converse kind of like idea of this is that um, in programming and software development, like if you do it more than twice, it should be some function or some kind of like programmatic kind of thing that you put in versus copy and paste manually. Um, so if you see yourself especially having to like, oh, I have to copy and paste this every single time, it might make more sense for you to try to build it into a for loop or, you know, preferably into, into a function. Um, on extreme end, we haven't talked about objects, but you could do like object oriented programming, like you could build something around that. And the reason for this is, you know, maybe in that moment, you're like, yes, like I'm just going to copy and paste it, change each one, easy. And the problem is, is that if you go back to it later on, you might find it's like, hey, I need to change these parts. And you have to go back into it, change each one, where maybe it would have been easier if you're like, all right, all right, it's gonna be a for loop, it's gonna look over these four things and it's gonna be easy, versus like trying to search for each part that you're changing as you go through it. And so that's the idea is like why you wanna make things a little more modular, where you can like change one aspect and one line versus like looking for each part that you wanna change up. Um, this is fine like when you're prototyping, when you're just like checking it out, but then like, if you're trying to use it, you know, especially if you start using it over and over again, like you'll find yourself into corners like, oh man, I just like, like I made this more difficult for myself in the long run. So that'd be my suggestion. And it's also good practice for you guys. Like just, I think, you know, especially if you don't have a computer science background, it's just nice to be able to think more modular. And that's what you'll see, like that's what's more expected when you're doing more of that computer science programming part of it. And so it's a good habit to start, you know, practicing that muscle now. And so, I mean, I'm sure we learned this way earlier on, but when is it good to use, to define a function instead of using for loops? I think hmm, they, they are two separate kind of things. Um, but to kind of maybe put a little more like saying when you would do a function versus a for loop, a function in general is kind of like an action that you do to some, like you take some inputs and you're going to output something out, right? And so in general, like you can, it, this is where like, if in the beginning, like programming stuff, everyone always asks like when they learn about functions, like, but when do we make it a function versus not a function? And that's when, you know, the teacher professor goes, it, it, like, it all depends on how you feel basically and what okay. makes sense in that time. Um, but in general, if you think of something like a process of like a bunch of lines of code and it's like, you're doing this process and it's like, oh, you can think of this as like a machine. Like it's like, oh, I'm putting these things in here and it's the same actions over and over again and some output comes out, then that likely should be a function. Um, especially if you're doing that same like process more than twice. Like, then it's like, that makes a lot of sense to make that a function. Now in a for loop or while loop or whatever, but mostly in Python we're using for loops. And a for loop is mostly when we're thinking about saying, oh, we have some, process that's going to be repeated over over and over and over again with some kind of like um like how do i say this like changing inputs right and you're basically controlling those inputs so you can really think of it like maybe the inside of a for loop is the function right so you can take those parts in there but then have the for loop be the control aspect and this is why we call this control flow is that when we say for loops and while loops, again, we don't really use while loops too much in Python, sometimes we do. But the idea there is we're controlling what's being input in there. And you can think of like the inside as kind of like that for loop block like as a function. And so that's why it makes sense, like if especially like this part, if it's a complicated process, it might make more sense to make it a function and then have that one thing there. Because then if you're like, oh, I wanna change what's going on in this for loop, but I still gonna do the same for loop, you can change the function and not like, you know, look around and try to make it work. And again, it's just kind of making it more modular and a little bit easier to, um, what's it called, like debug and just observe that part. And it makes it readable too. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Thanks. Great question, by the way. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. Any 
other questions, follow up, anything like that? I, I had a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, so like the way that I could tend to like think about these things is maybe not technical enough. And so I'm wondering like how we're gonna be, like if it's better for me to like try to find data sets even if they don't necessarily require very much like, I don't know, like cleaning or tooling. So like, or if it's better to like use the data sets that are available and like work on our programming ability with them, even if it maybe doesn't answer the question as well. Like, I guess like mm -hmm. my, my whole thing is like, I think that most of the data points to Microsoft should probably not go into making movies. Like right. this is not a great time to do it. There's like not. Right. Okay. You're just kind of saying like, Hey, like, there's other reasons beyond just like like just analyzing the data by itself is that kind of what i'm getting at yeah so like like i'm trying okay. like if if i was gonna like like my the where i'm going towards is like recommending that they would be m way better able to get into and profit from like a streaming service versus a box office movie service so like i'm trying to find data sets for that there's less resources like Netflix doesn't release anything like, but like just in terms of like over, like, I don't know, like my overall, like if, if I was doing this as a data scientist hired by Microsoft, mm -hmm. I would do it differently that maybe than not mm -hmm. hired for as a student. So like, which, which direction should I go? I guess? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so let me make sure. Um, so, okay, I'm trying to get this around. So there's a couple things about this, right? And this is actually equates really well. And this is where I'm saying, you guys are like, you know, you guys are students, you guys are your first project. Obviously, you know, this is beyond just like doing a project because there's an assessment attached to it, right? But I think you really should try to go in the direction of like, hey, this is a data science project and I'm gonna be a data science, you know, I'm a data scientist and I'm in the role of a data scientist. So if you feel like, it's like hey, based on like, you know, like I wouldn't call it a hunch, but let's say that your domain knowledge, right? Your domain expertise, you know, just understanding what's around beyond just like the movies and stuff like that. Um, and you're like, hey, you know what? I think streaming is a better option for what they're doing loosely based on what you know, right? That's totally leg legitimate. However, if you're in the business, like, you know, talking to a business, right? Your stakeholders, um, you gotta be careful with like what you tell them in some sense. Cause like, the stakeholders might ask for something and you're like, I don't think that's the right question. And in a lot of cases, you know, this is where people online stuff will say that is like, you really have to understand as a data scientist, like, oh, like you need to approach them. Like they ask you a question, but it's not the right question. Approaching them saying you should really be asking this thing and I'm going to do this for you. Um, I think that's really important. And that's something that is definitely, that should be done. However, I will say is that you have to be careful too with what level you do this, right? Is that, if someone asks, like, let's just pretend this Microsoft, you know, asking for how to make movies, stuff like that, and say, hey, we're gonna hire you to like, you know, figure out what the best movies for us to make, right? And you go off, right? And you come back to them, like, in a couple weeks or a month or whatever. And you say, look, we don't want you, to, like, it's like all this data right here, like, um, shows that you should do streaming instead. And Microsoft goes, well, we didn't wanna do that. Like, that's, we wanted to make movies. Like, you know, that was like our thing. Like, obviously then you'll have a little bit of a conflict, right? Um, but, I will say is that like you have to be the judgment call like that. Some people would say, hey, like maybe that's worth the risk as being like helps you stand out as a data scientist, right? Or something along, that, along those lines. Like I can't tell you what degree, right? You should be on that spectrum just following exactly what the business asks versus like going against this. Um, but I will say is that the big thing you want is whatever you do, because we're data scientists, is to have data driven results is that you wanna be sure to like, if, even if you have um, like domain expertise or you know, maybe experience in the movie industry or whatever it is that you're doing, um, you wanna be able to bring, come back to your, um, your stakeholders and say, hey, here's the evidence that I have, that I have found of why I think you should do this thing, especially if it's something that's not quite what they were asking for, um, but maybe it's closer along the lines of what they were really, like, you know, quote unquote, what they are really asking you for. Does that make sense? Um, okay. And I think Steven, you're asking more though for like this particular project. Is that right? Or were you just kind of asking more in the general, like, oh, I think you're muted, Steven. Um, yeah, I guess like I'm asking for this particular project mm -hmm. also just like, 
I don't know. Like I, I found some data that would back that up, but I also don't want to feel like I'm like skipping. Like I could definitely do a genre analysis and say like this movie genre has a better like profitability mm-hmm. than this other one. You know, like, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. This is where I will say is that I think I'm trying to go between like, you know, just the project of we have, presented to you guys as students, right? And like what would make more sense, right? In like the business world. Um, I would say for this project, I don't want you guys to stretch yourself thin and trying to find really interesting, like, you know, and really like novel ways of approaching this project. And that what in the sense of being like, this is your first project. This is kind of like our first attempt at really doing a data science project. And this is the first part of it really. Like this is just doing an analysis versus like going into predictive modeling and all these different things. Um, so I will say for that kind of project, like for the sense that this is a project, I wouldn't suggest going in that direction because it might be harder to kind of find those parts and really making sure you kind of complete doing like practicing your analysis versus like trying to find data. Like you were saying, it's hard to find data for Netflix and stuff like this. Um, now kind of going a little bit, that's not to say that you can't incorporate this data. So one thing I would suggest, and this actually works really well, like in the scenario, like this is a real project, like, you know, from some business that actually hires you, you might do some analysis on the data that they're talking about. It's like, hey, you know, here's what we see in the movie industry. And these are kind of like the things. And then you say, but as an aside, we also were kind of looking at streaming data. And it seems like streaming data does suggest these things. And this is kind of a great kind of compromise if you really are like, like, hey, like, I think they should do streaming stuff without like completely just ignoring your stakeholders and just going rogue and like doing what you want, right? Like, you know, what you want or what you think is best. Um, this can be like, hey, okay, we have information about what, you know, this Microsoft goes like, oh, he gave us information about what was being done um, or like what we asked for. Like, you know, like, oh, what the good movies for us to invest for. But it's like, hey, you know, he does have a good point and you know, his data does seem to suggest streaming. Maybe we should, you know, have him come back and do a follow-up project on this, you know? or maybe we should explore those options and stuff. And that's where, you know, you can really kind of put that in there. Like um, this is where like, what's it called? Um, in the project, we talk about future work. That's a, that would be something along those lines too, where you can go into more detail about that specific area. Okay. Does that make sense? Like, especially in context of like how you could do it in this scenario? Yeah, I mean, I, like, yeah, this, this is just an interesting case. Cause like, I don't know, movie theaters across United mm-hmm. States, Europe, and Asia are going to be shut down for like the next who knows how long. It's probably like mm-hmm. literally the worst possible time to get into the movie industry. So like, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. That, that was just kind of where it's, it, it, that makes sense to kind of try to find a balance rather than like, be like, oh, I actually did a whole different project that's nothing like what you wanted. Right, which is definitely a danger that I have seen people do, (laughs) like whether they did it on purpose or not, like they kind of go in and they're like, oh, I'm going to do this project. And it's like, wait a second, like that's not what everyone's asking for. Um, And at worst, it puts them in a position where they don't want to pay them or they're like, they don't play as a team. Like, let's say you're internally, right? It's like, like they're not listening to it and they're not going to like you know, extreme ends, like, they're just going to fire you. Say, like, you're not doing your job, like, you know, fire you. Um, but, like, unless extreme end being, like, they they shake their heads. They're like, that's great, you know. But, Victor, you need to, like, like, we wanted you to do this. They're like, yeah, but this is so much cooler. And, like, and like you, this is a real reason why we should do this. They're like, yeah, but no. <laughs> like, you, you obviously have to play like, that game. Um, and also be kind of aware, right? I like to say it's like the data science trap. Um, you guys hear about, like, a nerd sniping? Like, do you guys know that? That means, has anyone ever heard this before? No? Okay. Nerd sniping is kind of like the idea of like, you have like this really interesting puzzling problem and you have someone who's just like, they get really involved with like this problem and like they almost like obsessively like think about this kind of thing. Um, I think data scientists, you know, maybe just personality wise, we tend to kind of go towards this direction where like, this is a really interesting thing. And we go down these rabbit holes that honestly, like, this is the hard part with nerd sniping. It's like, it's really interesting for us, but no one else cares. And it's always hard to hear that. Like, I, I say this in like the best thing, because I've done this. I will 100% say I've done this, is that um, I remember one big thing, at, like really early on, it's like, I had this like really great equation that was going to model basically like, you know, um, basically transactions and stuff like this. And 
I was kind of going detail and I was like, oh, you know, this is great because it's continuous, you know, it's um, actually differentiable, you know, along the whole spectrum, like of what we're looking at. And they were like, oh, but this part right here is good. Like, yeah, yeah, that's good. But like, look at this beautiful thing that I created and they didn't care. And of course, that's the thing that spent the most time. So like, you know, that is something that really does happen. And um, just kind of be aware of that, I guess, you know, um, as the scientist, I think, you know, you guys are probably more on the analytical side where those kind of interesting problems kind of happen and just be careful, I guess, to not go down those rabbit holes. Yeah. Or if you do go down those rabbit holes, at least have a way to get out of them or say, oh, let me put a, let me put this on the side and like do this a little bit later or suggest it as like future work if you're working with a project. Yeah. I just want to say I love that it's called nerd sniping. I've literally never heard that before, but yeah, I totally relate to that. <laughs> That's awesome. Because XKCD always has a relevant article. Um, <laughs> so, or a little comic. So like this one is a little more based around physics and whatnot, whatnot but um, the idea is like, you can kind of read this through, but he basically has like a little um, diagram here. It's like, you know, an infinite grid, which is physicists love infinite grids and stuff like this of ideal one ohm resistors. What is the equivalent resistance between these two marked nodes? And basically it's like the whole idea is some of these problems kind of pop up where they basically try to make you think and then like you get sucked in. And then like, I've had these things where I'm like, I need to know how to do this. Like I need to figure this out and people have arguments. So anyway, um, this happens every once in a while, but yeah. Anyway. Nerd sniping. <laughs> Nerd sniping. <laughs> be, be aware, you know, as a data scientist. Cool. Um, no, this is all great questions. I will put that on list here. We talked about uh, for loops versus uh, functions. Some alliteration right there. Not much. Um, and we got, um, I don't know, going against the business. <laughs> I don't know. That seems like too bad, but like, um, I don't know, um, tangential interest. I'm just trying to put this stuff so we can kind of refer this. Oh, got the eye. Cool. Good questions, by the way. This is all really great. Um, anything else you guys have, whether it's specific to the project or overall? Hey, um, I had a little something I was thinking of uh, that I wanted to get your input on. So yeah. when we're looking at the, at the movies, and you look at genre and you'll have a movie belongs to three four genres right mm -hmm. um obviously one would be the main genre that it's in but it's kind of difficult sometimes to separate them right because you can have a an adventure and a drama it's an adventure drama uh romantic and comedy it's a romantic comedy or it's an action comedy or it's right so do you, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to really separate it and say it's just this or it's just that. Because in many mm -hmm. cases, those are, those combinations are genre, subgenres in, in their own. Would you go about approaching something like that by encoding so that you can sort of capture the, the various mm -hmm. genres that, that the movie belongs to rather than trying to find one main genre to stick it into and yeah. you know avoid the others yeah so you're saying like what would be a good thing to go like do you go like just like just say oh it's gonna be a comedy or it um versus like saying oh it's a comedy and it's also a romance and it's you know a drama or something like that yeah and this right. so something mm -hmm. something like american hustle right that mm -hmm. was that's a drama and a comedy and it's a true story Right, mm -hmm. so a lot of you know a lot of movies fit fall into multiple categories at the same time, mm -hmm. and sometimes if you try to stick it in just one, you kind of miss out on something. Right, there's some mm -hmm. information that 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 you lose. Right, so mm -hmm. thinking of is whether maybe encode the data so that it captures all of the all of the genres except that possibly weighted towards the first one that appears in the list. <laughs> yeah, so this is a really interesting idea because I think you can do a whole, you can do a whole bunch of arguments for this. Um, so one thing you mentioned is about encoding, and this is where, um, I don't think we've talked about this, but we'll see this a lot, is something called one-hot encoding. 
we does anyone know what that is by chance? I see not from Alvera. Yeah. I don't think it's in the curriculum, at least at this point, right? Um, no one else knows one hot encoding. So a main thing about like one hot encoding basically is see if I can just draw this because this might be easier than me trying to type it out on the fly. Is that basically it's like okay, like you have something like genre, like this, right? And then you would have like you know like oh a bunch of genres like genre one, comedy, romance, right? Maybe this one's just drama. This one's like a drama a comedy and a romance. I'm only doing squiggles because I, I'm not gonna write fast enough. Um, so one hot encoding says, okay, well, this is like, you know, too complex, right? Or like, you know, like, it's like, okay, like it's romance and comedy, you know, but like, we wanna say it's romance and there's also comedy aspects of it. So one hot encoding allows us to say, well, instead of having this as one column, we'll instead say, okay, is it a comedy? And then uh, that will be the column. And this will be like, is it a romance? I'm just gonna put Roma, okay. And then, I don't know, drama, right? Drama, I'll just be GR, because I write slow. <laughs> so we have comedy, romance, drama, and then each row is like, oh, it's like, usually we say true or false. Usually we say one hot encoding, meaning like one meaning true, zero meaning false. So it's like, oh, it is a comedy and it is a romance, but it's not a drama. And then this one's like, oh, this one's just a drama. You know, so we have a one there. And like, oh, this one's all three of them. So what this can allow you then is say, okay, like, let me look at all the movies that are just comedies, like, or like, you know, like that are, that have comedy aspects of it. It might be comedy romance or comedy drama, but at least it's like looking at just the comedy one. And then you can pull out and observe patterns in that one. You can also say, well, okay, what if I want to look at just say comedy in romance together, right? So you can say, oh, okay, well, these two, you know, these two columns, it's like only show me the ones that are both of these columns and then compare comedies with comedy like rom romance comedies right romantic comedies and then you can do that comparison um that can definitely have more like like more nuance more you know quality to it in your data like when you're actually doing your analysis um and ex the opposite of this of separating it out is just literally treating comedy and romance if you had co comedy and then romance this is now like one factor comedy romance, and this is just drama. And this is comedy romance drama. And all three of these are completely separate from each other. Um, now that might lose information. And this is where um, I will say like for data, like, how do I say this? Um, <laughs> usually I would talk about things like your data, like is not, how do I say, oh, man, I'm trying to get, say this in the in a proper way but basically is that your data are never complete like there are always more things for you to add on to the data because your data is showing like a kind of a summary of some information like you don't have perfect amount of information like perfect amount of information would be like you have the pictures you have the video you have when it was made you have the script you have all this information all together to the point where like it's so much information, it's too much. Like you would say, oh, you need to know the bios of every person who's ever appeared in it. What are the shots? What are the, like, this is kind of like the overall, like what this movie actually is. And the data are really just saying, hey, can we summarize the overall aspect of this thing that exists with some features that we can do that's manageable? And this is where you say, well, okay, like to what level can we do this? Um, there isn't a direct thing saying, oh, one way is better than the other. In general, we say as data science, we like to have more, you know, like more fine-tuned data because then we can always like combine it together to make, you know, less, like more coarsely grained data. Does that make sense? And then if we had something that's really coarse, it's not easy to necessarily make it more fine-tuned. Like if someone, yeah, like in this case, it's actually a bad example because if you had like something like com romantic comedy, you could probably split up and say, oh, it's a comedy in a romance. Um, but then also one thing that uh, Alvaro was mentioning, right, was saying, oh, we like have a wait for like, oh, the first one that appears and stuff like that. So one thing you have to know is I don't know if this is from the data set, um, but uh, first of all, knowing is it true that the first one that appears is like what it's more. And then also if you have comedy, romance, drama, and then comedy, romance, and let's say comedy, romance, and action, do we know what percentage comedy this movie is versus this one that's comedy even though they both have it first maybe you know really want like that first movie is like oh it's really comedy like it's like basically a comedy and then it's got a little bit of romance on the side and the other one's oh it's really like 
a comedy romance drama, you know, or action or something like that. And so be careful with like trying to add extra information on something you're not exactly sure about. In the sense I'm saying you don't know exactly because like you don't know to what level you can really define it because that can also put like essentially extra, like when I say bias, right? Bias is, is putting extra information in there that might not really exist. Um, so I would say the safer option would be if you want to split it out by saying, oh, it, this is a comedy, this has comedy aspects, so it's classified as a comedy, this has romance aspects, so it has romance, and it can have both of them. Does that make sense? Um, these are, this is a really good question, though, like, because that is definitely, like, the definition of, like, how we kind of go through data and, like, how do we know, like, you know, what we know. Um, yeah. Any follow-up on that or any clarification you want to add? Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Go ahead, Nyla. Yeah, um, so, so with the different data sets that we have, like, is it best to, like, pull one and then, like, go through that data and then, like, pull another one? Like, the yeah. data sets that we have? Okay. So, I will say is that, um, I would say no, actually. So, I'm going to say something like, um, what, maybe you guys did something different, and it's not a big deal. Um, but I think a, a better way to approach this problem is to pretend you don't have any data at all like and you say all right someone comes up to you and says hey we want to make you know a movie uh some movie company whatever right um we want to know what's the best movies we should invest in right like what should we make and then you should think to yourself pretend you don't have any of this data it's like okay what would i need to determine you know what movies they should make and so have a picture of your head, like in your head and like literally write it down and say, these are the things, you know, these are the questions that I would want to look into. These are the things I think are important factors. These are things that are maybe factors, but maybe less important, right? So maybe, for example, maybe you wrongly, wrong, wrongly think this, but you're like, maybe season, season has a factor, but maybe it's not that huge of a difference. Um, and then later on, you find out like, oh, season does have a huge factor in it, but at least kind of putting those ideas down. And then once you have those ideas down, then saying, okay, let's either collect data, like, whatever data from an API and stuff like that. Um, sorry, it's <laughs> seeing like he's waving with a little baby. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, sorry, let's mention that for a second. Um, <laughs> but if you have your idea of what you want from your data, and then you say, okay, like, let me go ahead and from this picture of what I think is important, either collect the data or use the data you already have and say, okay, like these are the things I can pull out. Oh, this part's in there. It's, oh, the thing that I really wanted in here is missing. And then you think to yourself, is this really necessary or do you think I can get away with not using it or do I need to actually go find extra data? And in some cases you might say, this is actually really important information, but I just don't either have the time or the resources, like maybe this data is just not available, that you kind of make a note of this and say, hey, like in, as your future work and saying, hey, if we can get this data that we weren't able to get because of either time or just the fact that it doesn't exist, um, that would be great. I think there is some reason for us to explore this. And that's what you put into your future work. And so I think that's kind of like, like, even though we call, you know, we say data scientists, right? I really think sometimes people like get data and they think that they need to like use that data to ask the questions where really it should be kind of the opposite of being like, what's the thing that we're looking at? What questions should we like, you know, ask the questions there and say, can we get the data to answer those questions. And sometimes it does come out where you look at the data and you're like, oh, there's some interesting part in here I didn't think of, right? And that's when you can get some really interesting, you know, um, like interesting insights and stuff like this. But I think it always comes down to, you have to have some form of question that you're looking for first. Otherwise, you might find things in the data set that might not actually be like either useful or actually like quote unquote real. Like in a sense that you might find things that are patterns that don't actually just come out, like basically they come out of chance. Um, so you have to always be aware of those kind of things. Yeah, good question though, Nyla, because um, I think that's a big one where I think it's important to kind of have an idea of what you want to move forward with before you just dive into data. Going with like trying to figure out that the data that we're provided with, has anyone had or had like particular luck find, like I, I just know some threads talking about like trying to merge tables has anyone found, like, I know that there exists an IMDb ID for movies that would be a really good thing to match things across, but I can't find it on the data set that we have. I don't know. Just wondering if anyone's had any luck merging. Um, I got mine from TN's API, and it's it had 
uh, yeah, they they had uh, each ID and what genre it is. Yeah, and um, I don't know IDs how I can are, share that, but the IDs are included in the IMDb. If you look at the uh, the what is it T something or other ID, that's a, yeah, the movie ID, the title ID. Yeah, I mean, I like I haven't really liked the IMDb data that we have in terms of like I feel like it doesn't have very much. Like, if you're trying to merge it with gross, I guess it doesn't really like fit with like profitability very well. Nope. I don't know. Um, but yeah, for the how uh, under genre, I don't remember which data set, but it would just have like ID numbers. Is that what you're talking about or no? Uh, well, I mean, if, if for, if for the IMDb, you're going to see these, these like sort of longish numbers that start with T or NM. The NM is the names of the people. IDs for, uh, those are the IDs for the actors, producers, and so on. The title of the movie starts with T. T uh, it, it's an ID. Uh, I forget exactly what it is. I don't have it in front of me. It starts with T, and even and sometimes you'll see it like for an act of what movies was he in. Well, there's a list of all of these IDs of all of the movies that the actor was in. So just take a look, and uh, if you go to IMDb, they do have the schema there that tells you what uh, what these things are. Well, I guess the main thing I wanted to figure out was like if anyone had had more luck with how to merge the tables using like ideally I would use like a movie code because then it's an identifiable like unique number to a, to have be it, everything be indexed to but because like titles is a huge mess like movies well, have different yeah. language titles and multiple of the same titles and it, like it just looks horrible. So. Yeah, well, techni technically, these those uh, those IDs, those so-called title IDs, really identify one movie. And even if it has multiple titles, the, all those titles are under the same ID. And that's what I saw. So uh, one of the things I found is that all the IMDb ones could be merged quite easily with the T-cons, which Alvaro mentioned. But then so, uh, the budget and worldwide gross and all that is from the numbers database. And that one obviously doesn't have the same T-cons because it's not an IMDb mm -hmm. thing. So when you want to merge with that, which has all the financials, that's when it gets sort of really tricky. Um, I merged on movie name, but obviously first I had to remove any duplicate movies, um, like remakes or anything. Otherwise, it would potentially match like a, a expensive remake with the old original or something. So one way was yeah. just to keep the most recent one, but um, still that you're still merging on strings, which isn't neat because like a name can be spelt slightly different or a capital letter or like every little thing causes it to not or even just an extra well. space in like one part of it can really mess you up on strings but the um the numbers one was the only one which had the budget though which is one thing which you i found really interesting so Correct. i accepted the hit and put that part <laughs> and just moved on with i think i had um, so do you just you just so went with end. like the the most recent Merge on one? movie yeah, I kept the most recent one, thinking they would be more interested in, more interested in the budget and gross for the like current like most recent movie. Yeah, your your like <laughs> five different Robin Hoods example kind of scared me. So. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say is that this is pr this is um you know obviously this is part of the project, right? Is that like the you know the curriculum team that wrote this repo didn't give like necessarily the cleanest best data that's already pre done everything but this is also pretty difficult too of like the kind of data sets that either you're given or that you find and you're just like i want to cross reference this data set and this data set and you're like oh this would be amazing if i could merge these together but there isn't like a unique identifier that they share between the two of them and this is one actually like a really common thing in all like data analytics too um this is actually a big reason um like i will say social security um, which really shouldn't be, there's a whole bunch of reasons why social security shouldn't be in the form that it does now um, in the US, but because there was never a unifying identifier officially, the social security ended up being this number. And I will tell you is that pretty much now it's like, that is standard across almost all financial institutions and stuff and everything where everything is referenced by basically your social number. 
like, and that's the way they can combine people because obviously people can change names, you know, names are repeated and stuff like this. Like I have, my first name is actually Victor Space Lauren is my first name. Um, I have gotten every variation of that I could, like just for the fact that I have two first names um, where that means like I have my first name and now it's a middle name or it's my first name where it's a space, first name with um, it squeezed together. Other times where Lauren's completely gone out of my whole like, you know, official documentation. And so you can quickly see it's like, just from that one example, it's like, yeah, this is awful. And this is kind of, I don't know, I think it's a little fun part of like data science too, but also like the most like infuriating aspect of being like, why won't these data just be able to combine together? Why can't they get along? And this is where like strings and stuff are just awful. Um, <laughs> Cause you can get some weird stuff that people do, especially like user input data. It's probably like, if you find out the data is user inputted, you'll probably find out that there's a whole bunch of mistakes and you're just going to be like finding mostly mistakes. And this is why data cleaning can actually take a huge amount of time because it's just the biggest part just to be able to do anything with it. But yeah, but great. Thank you guys for like sharing all of like what you guys have done and what you guys have found. Cause I think honestly, like I've said this before and I'll keep emphasizing it is that you guys really should work, you know, as best you can like learn from each other, you know, um, I encourage you guys always to ask questions on the Slack channel. Like, it's funny, people will ask me individual questions, like, you know, on Slack and like DM me. I'll kind of say, hey, you should post this on the Slack channel because, like, there's a lot of people who ask the same questions. And sometimes people will have great answers to. Some people will say, like, oh, yeah, I'm also kind of figuring this out. Um, and I think those are the things that help, like, how do I say this? Like, the things you remember the most are not things that someone just tells you the answer to. It's kind of the things that, like, you bang your head against the wall for a little bit. And then you kind of figure it out, whether it's with the help of someone or with yourself. Um, so that's why I try to encourage you guys to embrace that process, even if it's a little painful at, at times. Um, but yeah, sorry. If you guys have anything else you guys wanted to ask or um, chime in on that. Um, so I know, I think it, is our presentation supposed to be five to eight minutes? Mm -hmm. that yeah, right? that's okay. the ideal is five to eight minutes. Um, we really like beyond 10 minutes. It's kind of like you really overshot it. And, like, I don't want to like, how do I say this? If your presentation is going for 15 minutes, it means that you might have kind of gone off a little bit and maybe you haven't practiced it. That's why it kind of like you really should aim for five to eight minutes. And this is pretty typical too. Like if you're asked to give a 10 minute presentation, you don't want to be that guy, you know, or a person that goes like for 10 minutes and just like, or like for 20 minutes and you're, people keep looking at their watches being, hey, like you need to get done with this. Um, so kind of be aware of that. Also, I don't have too many of this, but you can also have it too short. Um, I would say anything under three minutes, it's like, hey, like it's not usually someone's talking through it too quickly. It's more like there isn't enough, there isn't a huge amount of information here. And it needs to be kind of more fleshed out. Um, so five to eight minutes, I think, if anything, most people will probably find they're like, oh, I need to cut out stuff or I need to like streamline this a little bit more than like, you know, beef it up. That makes sense. Yeah, because I had my first couple of questions I asked and those kept leading to more questions. And then there's so much, I just, I wonder if I should call it down a little bit, so. Yeah, I will say is that the big thing that will kind of like be your like, threshold thing is like, is this important? Um, and the, like you should list like, what are the most important things I need to make sure the stakeholders understand before pleasing for? Not the details, but like, what are the main points that they need to know? And then saying, what are the things that lead up to those main points? Um, and that's kind of stuff you put in there. And then everything else is extra detail. And of course, you know, if there are more stuff you can say, and there's more information, you know, like, you can check out the report, you know, you can talk more, like this is like in a real life scenario too. Um, I know it's uh, the hour, so, but I just wanted to quickly kind of mention about that presentation versus non-technical or non-technical versus technical. Um, remember the non-technical, it's kind of like that presentation. You should have it practice. It's about like five to eight minutes and everything like that. Um, this is where people say, what about the technical piece, right? Like, is that a presentation? What is that like? That is much more like a conversation with like someone who's data minded. So that could be either your data team member, data manager, that kind of feel. And really what you're doing is you're getting someone el um, up to speed who is familiar with data science, but doesn't really know your specific project. So kind of imagine you're like talking to someone and you're basically, okay, this is how I got the data. 
this is what I found, you know, this is how I cleaned it, you know, and the person next to you, you know, next to you kind of going through is like, oh, like, you know, what about this? Like, have you thought about getting this data? It's like, why did you use to do this method over this method? Or saying, like, oh, you know, I noticed from your like exploration graph right here is like, I'm noticing this thing, like, you know, do you think there's a reason for that? Or like, you know, do you think it's this reason? And you would have a conversation with them. So you could have like the technical presentation, presentation is much more like a conversation. So you should still be familiar with your notebook, familiar with your data, familiar with your project. But basically um, that part of the assessment is much more saying, hey, do you feel, have you really thought about this problem? And have you really feel like comfortable with this data set? And really in a sense, like just know what you're showing versus like just having a bunch of graphs and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So then, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, if I did have extra graphs that were part of my more exploratory analysis, can I leave those in the notebook? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like absolutely. any, like you can think of your presentation for your non-technical. It's like the things you're talking to your stakeholders who might not be familiar with data science, but there might be other evidence for the things that you say that would be in your notebook and you can keep that in your notebook. So, yeah. Cool, thanks. That kind of mm -hmm. like reminds me just in general, like how neat should our notebooks look? Like how, who's the audience for that? Yeah, so I will say, um, I will, as if I put a threshold of being like, oh, you should just have it at least this neat. Um, I will obviously like say, be as neat as you can, right? Like make it as readable as possible. But the important part is that it's readable, that my my thing for you guys is not directly in the rubric, but it should be able to stand on its own without you talking to someone about it, if that makes sense. So someone comes across your, um, like your repo, your um, notebook, and they can go and walk through that notebook and understand what's going on there. And they don't have to be like, why did they do this? You know, like, you know, like, wait, what happened here? So, or like, why are they doing this graph? So that means basically one, your code's clean. There's not like a bunch of like weirdness. And if there's kind of like a weird function or some things that you're doing, you have a comment on there or a doc string of the function. Um, you should have markdown cells for really saying, you know, why you are investigating this part. And then like, you know, if you have your um, explore, exploration, like, you know, graphs and analysis and stuff like that saying, oh, here are my, um, what's it called? Like, here are my reasons for what, or like not reasons. Here's what I found, you know, this is what I think we should do next, you know? So you should kind of have a little bit of like sandwiched between um, like your, any like your code stuff, probably have some sandwich between like of saying why you're gonna do this thing and saying what were your overall kind of results. And then I will say too, this is one thing that people tend to forget, is at the very bottom of your report, you really should, of your like notebook, you really should have a conclusion um, re reiterating what you found. So even if you talked about it, you really should reiterate it at the bottom so people can find it, um, as well as kind of like future work and like your overall recommendations. So just making sure that's like, you know, that might be between like three to like maybe six paragraphs-ish, you know, depending how you feel we want to write that. So yeah. does that make sense about cleanliness of notebook and what that kind of looks like? Cool. And there's just one last question. This is totally mm -hmm. random, but should like when we import stuff, is it like best practice to like import all the programs that we're ever going to use right at the top? Like all the, all the different things is that. Kind of yeah, I, I would say like, I think some people, sometimes people like will import stuff in the middle. I personally, like if I'm doing my notebook, I will move all my imports to the top because it's really obvious saying these are the packages you need to run this notebook. So if someone else downloads it and tries to run it, they can see immediately what packages they have to have installed. So that's pretty common stuff like that. If you don't have that, it's not the worst thing, but I personally would recommend saying, yeah, put all your imports on the top because you can always rearrange things. Okay. I mean, that, that should go in your requirements section of your notebook. Yes, <laughs> yes, requirements, exactly. You should have like, ideally you should have a requirements.tax and that you can use that to like install and stuff like this. We haven't really talked too much about that, you should also kind of in your readme say like these are the things that you need but also i like to think of it like if i just share this notebook like or someone grabs this notebook and like shares it out but they have no context of anything else of it just the notebook itself i want to be able to show hey this is on the top people can figure basically can at least initially say oh these are the packages you need um that, again there's a whole bunch of redundancies that you should have in, in addition to that but at least i think like the notebook like worst case scenario is all by itself 
someone else should still be able to relatively use it and understand what's going on. Cool. All right. I know we kind of went a little bit over, but I don't, I don't think you guys mostly mind. I know some people have to drop out and stuff like that because, you know, it is time. Um, but yeah, just kind of quick things before I uh, wrap up. Um, if you guys have more questions, of course, Slack channel, right? Um, I'll definitely put out um, the Google Doc on like um, the link on LearnCo. So I'll make sure to do that tonight. Um, so that way you guys can add things in there. Um, let's just kind of make sure I get there. Tomorrow we have our Wednesday check-in, kind of like Friday feels, right? I'm thinking this might be a little bit easier. Um, I know it's not necessarily, like it might not be the same kind of thing as like asking questions office hours instead of groups. I still recommend coming into it because it does kind of give us a time to talk to each other and also talk about things like Sometimes for these kind of things, we talk about like data related stuff. For example, a big deal right now is coronavirus and like see, figuring out from the data, like what does this mean? You know, what does this kind of evolve to and stuff like this? And I think that'd be a really fun thing to, well, I don't know if fun's the right word for it, but it'd be an interesting topic to talk about uh, tomorrow and everything. And then of course, that's at 5.30 PM Eastern time. Um, I mean, we have the ch time change too, like the wrong end here. But, um, and then on Thursday we have, another office hours or last office hours. So make sure, you know, if you guys have any questions, that's a great time to ask. It's going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So just kind of be aware of that too. And I think we'll try to keep the schedule overall. I think most people could at least make one of these times. I couldn't make it so everyone could attend it. In fact, I thought maybe if I put things later, I thought more people could attend, but it looks like not, at least based on the survey. Um, so I think it's actually a good time. Plus if it's too late, I think people are more likely to say, you know what? I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, head off to bed versus like, you know, go to a study group. Um, so, but of course we try to record everything. So hopefully you guys at least have that. All right, everyone. Cool. All right. Well, I hope to see you all tomorrow um, and good luck with the project. Again, ask questions, share, um, and I'll see you all around. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.